was someone who's not a, a player to understand the mentality behind it. The need to go out and be competitive, go out and practice, to play tournaments, to give up a lot of your life to be involved in, in the competitiveness. You know, are, are there people whom you feel as if they can't understand it? Because, you know, this kind of competitiveness, everybody else says, I give it up. I'm going to be mediocre. I'm going to have a job. Well, that's, uh, sure, there are plenty of people. As a matter of fact, I'm not supposed to be playing anymore as it is because of a uh, physical ailment that I had. I had a gl blood clot in my arm. And the doctor tells me I shouldn't play, but I'm still, I'm still playing. I try to be careful and limit myself. Not press too hard, but, you know, he thinks I'm crazy. Right. Especially since I'm not making a living. As far as he's concerned, if it doesn't put money in my pocket, then, I, you know, it's not worth doing. What did you deal with that? I mean, at first, were you depressed that you couldn't... I was very depressed. I was ter terribly depressed. I didn't play for almost eight or nine months. I put on a couple of pounds, got a little soft around the middle. That's enough to depress anybody. Right. Besides the fact that you're not playing and releasing that aggression. Come by sit down, you watch all the other guys play, that you, you love to be in the, in the middle of the game, and you right. have to sit there and be a spectator instead. Right. Then you kind of stand out, because you're a pharmacist. A lot of these people are kind of salesmen or hustlers of various kinds, or people who have managed to figure out how not to work. And here you are, a so-called, uh, well, I mean, a middle-class person among these flakes, insane people. How does that make you feel? I didn't say they were necessarily flaky, but they managed to build their life around something that was important to them. If they were salesmen, then they could grab a few hours in the middle of the day, or if they're retired, then obviously they have time to do what they want to do. It doesn't mean that the, you know, the rest of their life isn't important. They were just successful in shaping it around playing ball. Okay, now, quite a few of the people who we've been uh, seeing and talking about um, have a kind of, almost an insanity about them, almost a kind of a psychotic quality about them. Uh, it seems to, to go along with this game somehow that some of the people are really weird, like uh, Charlie Bananas, for example. I was watching that tape that you gave me. He talks to himself all the time. If I saw him on the subway, I'd say he's crazy. On the handball court, it's okay. Well, a lot of people talk to themselves. <laughs> uh, Charlie's a good example. People think he really is sick, but he happens to be a real nice fella. He just verbalizes himself instead of thinking things to himself. Yep. You know, a lot of players don't have coaches, and they act as their own coaches. When they're speaking, it's sort of like an alter ego. is Like they have a, <laughs> two personalities, almost. Well, that's pretty crazy right there. Yeah, but the crazy part to outsiders is that they ver they're verbalizing it instead of just thinking it. Right. I mean, anytime people do things in any part of their life, they uh, second think it a lot of times if they make a decision. How do you feel out there? Do you talk to yourself? I mean, uh, you know, you seem pretty much a, a pretty business-like person out there. What's going on inside you? you know, I, I talk to myself sometimes, but usually I use it as a ploy. Uh, what I do is I sort of just think out to myself. If I miss something or I'm doing something wrong, I'll, you know, just have the thought in my head instead of verbalizing it. Sometimes I'll verbalize it, like I said, as a, as a ploy to throw up the opponent. Hmm. If I go for a shot and the person's there and the, my opponent is in the right place, maybe I'll say out loud, you know, I, you can't keep going there. He's, He's reading it, just to, <laughs> to make the person think that I'm going to do something right. else. But you can do that with it, without talking also. You can use what they call tells. You look to maybe one side of the court two or three times, make it very obvious that, you know, you might be thinking of hitting the ball in that direction, and then you hit it to the other side of the court. But there's a lot of, there is a lot of stuff like that. <laughs> You know, like well, it's it's a lot like like cards playing because sometimes you try to fake out your opponent. Like I said, you might want to look to one side of the court to make it seem obvious that you're going there, and then 
in fact, hit the ball to the other side, almost as if you're lying to them. And then again, you could double cross them and do what it actually seems like you're doing. All right, now, is there something about the ability to get an opponent to think consciously that takes them out of their out, out of their mode, out of their playing mode, their instinctual playing mode? Well, sure, because when you get to the top of any kind of athletic competition, the difference usually is the difference in the mind. You know, one player will hit the ball harder than the other, another one will run fast, but pretty much if you add up all the physical attributes, they're pretty even. And the difference really is, you know, the mental approach to the game. Unforced errors, uh, you get into a pressure situation, some people rise to, the, rise to the occasion, other people crack. And there is a lot of manipulation of your opponent. How do you do it, or is, have you got a strategy to make your opponent think and to doubt and uh, wonder and say what's coming next and to guess? Or do, you, uh, or, or, or do you let it happen? No, every, everybody has that. I'm just a little more subtle. I usually don't uh, open my mouth as much. You know, some people like to do a lot of talking and try to berate their opponents to get them aggravated and maybe make them overhit the ball. Yeah. I try to use things that are more subtle, like I said before, a glance in one direction or I change the spot that I'm going to serve from, right. or I mi mix up the, uh, the serves that I use so that the opponent doesn't really know what to expect. Against a player like Eddie Golden, who's a retriever par excellence, you've got a couple of, of retrievers out there. They come out essentially with the same strategy. Um, how do you play him? Well, Eddie, like you said, is a nice retriever, but I, I can run with him, so there's no problem there. Right. But there's no sense in that, really, because he doesn't have the court game. So what you do is you just get him into a court game. You negate, you negate his best shot at winning a ball. Yeah, well, his best shot seems to be a low shot on the side, either to the left or the right. So I guess you play him high and in, into the middle, or? Well, if I have to, I play him that way. But a lot of times, contrary to what I said, I'll play just a hard low game, which is more effective against other players. See, he's a match that I would usually play in a semifinal game. Mm -hmm. And instead of changing my way of playing, unless it was necessary, I would just keep the same style and use it, use his ability to retrieve as an advantage to myself, because it would make me go for my shots better. And when, after beating him and playing another fellow who doesn't retrieve the ball as well, it would be easier for me to make points. If I had trouble winning the game that way, then I would go to the alternate strategy, which you said would be more of a volley game. Maybe overhand serve, keeping him in the back court, where he really doesn't have an overhand or a good left hand back there. He's could, pretty much a counter puncher. Yeah. Now, speaking of strategy, could you tell us what Steve Sandler said to you in that championship game in 1991? He came on the court and he talked with you. Well, it was about a month ago. We, you know, we oh, did, uh, 1991. Yeah, the June 1991 game. He came on the court, he came over to you, and he spent about a minute and a half talking to you. Had it been about strategy? Well, usually what he says is serve the ball deep in the beginning. It's something that he likes to do personally because right. he feels that in the beginning of a match, your arm isn't as, as loose and limber as, let's say, 10 or 15 minutes into the game. So when you try to serve low, you're not really ready to serve hard and low. Right. So what he usually likes to tell people to do is serve deep. And it's sort of like using a weight on a baseball bat. Then when you take the weight off, you feel like you could swing the bat easier. Uh -huh. Well, serving deep is hard. You have to put more effort into it. And then after you serve deep for a few points and you try to serve low, it seems easier. Right. Well, Besides, that's... he's always had a very good volley game. And most people, give advice that is good for themselves, not necessarily <laughs> for the player that that they're trying to help. So yeah. for him, his main idea is serve the ball deep and, and get into the volley, which he was always favored against the other players. Right, because he was extremely consistent and, and he didn't make errors, yeah. In this case, uh, in the finals this year, I thought it was a good idea because I was a bit arm wary 
and also it takes a lot of a lot of power to serve the ball hard and low like I used to. Because I'm hesitant about my arm, right. I would rather just go with the deep serve, which I don't really have to hit so hard. Mm. But it was it was no accident that I found a job in this area. Have it was just a, a matter of time. Have you got a sense of the fate or providence, you know, that in, in, in some way a divine or a cult spirit is on your side that keeps you into the life that you need to live to develop in the way that you need to develop? I mean, have, have you got that sense, or is it actually... spirit? No, I think everybody's pretty much in control of their own fate. Uh-huh. And, and you just find your way into it. Well, it's not a matter of just. It takes a lot of hard yeah. work sometimes. Now, the two of us were talking earlier, and you said that you're the kind of person who should, who should not be working for a living. Could you explain that? Yeah, well... There's a lot of other things I'd like to be doing besides filling prescriptions, which I do for, for a job. I'd like to get more involved in volunteer work with kids, and uh, I'd like to start making some furniture, stuff like that. Well, you have a pretty wide range of interests. You're a carpenter, you're a pharmacist. Well, I'm not a carpenter. I would like to know how to do it. you got a gorgeous house that you've been fixing up yourself. No, my brother-in-law. Oh, your brother-in-law did <laughs> Because it's 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 a terrific place. I helped a little bit. Right. And you're interested in photography and and uh, and uh, video shooting and all of that. So there is a way. Have you found out? Have you have have you found it to be true about the handball people that they are either more narrow or less narrow than the average person? Just the the fact that they've been been able to shape their their life around playing ball and make it possible, you know, shows that. They're in uh, control of their fate to a certain to a certain point. I would say a lot larger in control, or, or a lot more in control than most people. Right. How many people have a chance to spend a good part of their waking hours acting in exactly the way that they want? Oh, well, yeah. You, you choose pretty much besides what you want to do. A lot of people give up the opportunity to make more money in order to enjoy themselves sure. more. Which, you know, if you're in a position to do that, that's great. But some people aren't in a position to that, and unfortunately, the money means more to them right, right. Than, uh, than their leisure time. How do you deal with, I'm, you know, with the guys who cheat a little bit, like, uh, you know, the guys who will step into a block, they say, I didn't do it. Is there a point where you finally confront them, or do you just kind of withdraw? Or how do you deal with it? Well, it depends on the game situation. I'm just playing what's supposed to be a fun game. Some of that is done intentionally, just in, you know, just to be a little annoyed and have a little fun. Uh -huh. But there are other guys, especially when they start getting a little older, that try to do that to get an extra point here and there. Right, an extra few points here and there. Or <laughs> sometimes just players that are a little weaker and they try to get an extra few points. And what you do is, if you don't have to play them, you just avoid them. Right. I mean, you tell them once, twice, three times, and you don't need it. I could find other games that are... You know, every bit is good without them. Yeah. There's a kind of a vehemence in the way that everybody curses at each other out there. And then after the game is over, they're friends. Well, that's that's because it, it's not what it, what it looks like, really. It's just that they're just being honest with each other. You mm -hmm. have to remember, these people are friends to start out with. And if you can't insult someone that's your friend, yeah. uh, or tell them what's on your mind and then still be friends the next day, then they're not really your friend. Oh, I don't know. We'll give him the point in a 25 game.
I don't know if you want to put this on. No. One, one time I told uh, one of my friends to go fuck himself, and he got insulted. And I said, look, you know, why are you getting insulted? If I can't tell you to go fuck yourself, who can tell you? <laughs> and after he deliberated a little bit, he, he realized it's true. You know, I should be able to speak to him however we're comfortable. Even when I'm at, when I'm at work, I'll... I'll speak something like that with my boss, but of course, first I'll say, you know, if you mind, just say something, because he feels comfortable talking like that also. Right. I don't say it in a way to in insult him. Like if I use the word bullshit, if I say, you know, that's bullshit, it shouldn't be happening, he can handle that. Sure. How did the experience of knowing how unique the handball world was and how it could fill a part of your life a central part of your life. How did that come upon you? Had it had it happened by degrees or in a dramatic way or how? Well, it wasn't dramatic. It was actually quite gradual. I had been dating a girl who lived close by the course, and she played paddle ball. I played very little handball, as a matter of fact. And because she frequented the courts, I started frequenting them. And just gradually, year after year, I kept coming back and getting more involved with the game. Improving. But here are the people that are involved. Finding myself even just to come by even when I was injured and not playing. Yeah. It's, it almost becomes like a magnet. It draws you, doesn't it? Right. Yeah. But could you say the things that, uh, that uh, are drawing you? Is it the ceremony of handball? Is it the, the primordialness? Is it the ferocity or what? Well, I find it interesting. I, don't, I mean, it's enjoyable to play. It keeps you healthy. And also, I, I enjoy watching the other games. Right. Sometimes I, sometimes I just watch to, to study other players. Right. Okay, thank you very much, Albert Cozy. Well, it is like a magnet, though. It's almost like a, <laughs> It's almost like being addicted. Please go on. How do you mean? When, when, well, when I was younger, and the, even now, a lot of people feel that it's... It's like an addiction, like sort of like a disease. Once it gets into your blood and you start coming down and getting involved with the competitiveness of the game and playing with other people that are here every day, it sort of rearranges the priorities in your life. <laughs> for most people, permanently. For some people, only temporary. But 
how, how were the priorities rearranged? I mean, is that experience in, in some way, is it telling you something? Is it Well, every, every chance uh, these guys get, they want to run down and play ball, especially right. on the weekend when other players are there. And, I mean, people are attracted to this area in largely because of the spectators, because of the boardwalk. And that brings that brings the better players, and then on top of it, you know, just sort of uh, snowballs. And everybody likes playing in front of the crowd. You know? Oh, that's what it is. I mean, I can remember being a youngster and, and looking back, reflecting at, after the day was over. Wow, there was six or seven people watching the game. <laughs> you know, you come into the, you walk. I work work in the neighborhood. I walk around the streets. It's almost. Like I'm, I'm a celebrity. I meet three or four people every day. I walk back and forth on my lunch hour. Right. And they say, oh, when are you going to play? I want to come watch you. What time are you playing? That's and great. They, you know, it sort of suits you up a little bit. <laughs> All right, Albert. Uh, thank you very much, Albert Apuzzi, again. <laughs> I, I, I see this game as a kind of a dialogue in the form of a war. Or, you know, you know for example, how Joe... How, there's almost a kind of an intimacy at the same time there's a gladiatorial aspect to it. They also get to know each other in a curious way. And the thing that interests me about it, I was wondering if, if you could comment on that, is the kind of intimacy that these two men have after attacking each other for about a half hour. You're, you're striking at perhaps the heart of this game. Most people see it as a purely physical contest. But some years ago, I read a book. It was called The Psychic Side of Sport. And it elucidated in the finest form all the different mental and emotional considerations that truly go into this contest that you are talking about. It's almost as if, for a moment, if you imagine each player going outside of himself and looking at the scene and trying to figure out what it is that he must do to win. What happens is an emotional drain many times, which is part of the physical exercise. That's where unbelievable things happen. We've had champions of the past that were wonderful guys off the court, but as soon as they went to a critical level of fatigue, they became disoriented, in many cases became abusive. And it had nothing to do with their character. It was just something where the endocrine system sort of put chemicals into their bloodstream because their glycogen level was at a low that these different types of orientations became manifest. Now, what does that mean to you? Well, isn't there a discovery of character, how desperate you become? Uh, it, it is a part of your character, I think, if under desperate circumstances you become abusive. And, you know, in situations like the, you know, the ones that we've seen, you can discover aspects or levels of your own character that you didn't even know you had. Yeah. You've mentioned a very important point, but I was looking exclusively at the way the body chemistry is tied in with your physical energy. What you're alluding to was part of a study which Life magazine did some years ago. What they said in essence was that the character of the player is actually exhibited on the court. How you doing, all right? How are you doing? Why are you so hot and wet? I love you. I love you too. <laughs> Recreation New York City staff. What, uh, what does that mean? I work for the parks department. Box department. I got a shape in the box department. Too. All right. Someone gave it to me. So you must be a handball player. Otherwise not you really. Be I'm here. Not a Did you introduce yourself, Morris? No. Uh, Please introduce yourself. We just uh, honored Morris Levitsky for all his many years of service as the AAU chairman of handball, as a referee, as a guy who's always around. He's like a handball historian. And if you ever want to know anything about Morris Levitsky, even if he doesn't know it, he'll make it up. Yeah. How has the game changed from 20, 30, 40 years ago? No, don't go to 20, 30. Go to 40, 50. Okay. How has the game changed from 40 or 50 Am years I ago? on tape? Are you recording all of this? Everything you say is the oh, game against okay. you. Oh, okay. When I was a kid, 18 years of age, in 1931, I watched all the great handball, one-wall players. And since that time, lots of things have happened. They've moved the short line 
back one foot because people had tremendous serves and the serve was like 90% of the game. They've changed the ball several times. They even went from bl a black ball to a blue ball. How do you feel about the blue ball? It's Let easy me to explain hit it you. to you. No. Uh, we got and, you. And the people are so wacky that when they talk about this ball, they talk about the black ball. <laughs> they can't say the small blue. They're calling it the black ball or the hard ball. What, what do I feel about the color of the ball? Is it easy to follow? Yes, but it hasn't got the same type of a bounce that the original black ball had from yesteryear. It seemed to me that in the black ball you could spin it a lot better and it was a faster game. Well, I would say that it was true rubber yes. in the old days, I'm calling it old days, and this particular ball they're making now, some of, it, some of the balls are made in Mexico and some are made with synthetic rubber, therefore the bounce isn't gonna be true like it was years ago. The ball is much lighter and it seems to float. It's much more difficult to control the ball. Yeah. That it is. How about the uh, quality of the games? The I, I've been, of I've the been, players or the games? Of the players. I've been seeing, uh, I've been seeing almost, you know, everybody tries to overwhelm everybody else in the two Have games. you been watching the big blue or the small blue? I watched the big blue. So you're talking about an entirely different story. Okay. The big blue elevated from the pink ball that the kids played in the schoolyard right. 50, 60 years ago. It's a game where you don't need a glove. Right. You don't need any equipment at all. What do you gotta do most of the time? Stick your hand out and the ball rebounds off the wall and goes back to the wall like rick rack, like the kids played with, with the rubber band hooked onto the ball with the little stick. Now when you play with a small ball, you gotta control the ball. You really gotta have shots. It's an entirely different game. One of the problems we have is I'm not knocking the, the big blue because a lot of kids play it. It's easy on their hands. In order to play with the small ball, you got to go through several years of hardening the palm of your hand so you don't get a bone bruise that frequent. Yeah, speaking of that. Pink ball, you can play without a glove. And let me talk. Yeah. Uh, not pink ball, the big blue. And the ball gets so wet that many a time when a guy serves the ball, they say, yeah, you have to play it over, the ball skip. And which is true, it has to be that way. The reason for wearing a glove with the small ball is to try to keep the ball dry. When you're playing barehanded on a hot summer day, what are you gonna do, use 10 balls and keep switching them? I'm trying to explain the difference between, now Ruby Obert, campaign several times, played with the black ball, but I don't knock the blue ball. As long as you get kids to play, it's important. It's better to have them play with the big ball, small ball, pink ball, as long as you keep them hanging out with hooligans. That you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah. Matter of fact, handball became so important that even in the high schools, they have girls' teams playing against each other and boys' teams playing against each other. How do you feel about that? It was a male game in the old days. Now we had girl champions years ago, but they were never good enough to play with the men. Yeah. I'm sorry I had to put it that way. It's just like in tennis, uh, a man can't play against a woman, it's ridiculous. Yeah. How do I feel about it? Yeah. Let the girls play. Let them play with each other. Have you played against a girl? Have I played against a girl? When I played ball, they were good, but as I repeated, not as good as a man. Is there a different feeling of competition if you're playing against a female? Yes. Is, is there something There's a man mind? that adapts himself, Ruby Albert. He's one of the few people that comes around to this <laughs> park. And if he has to play in a strong game, he plays one way. If he yeah, plays he play with anyway. a couple of girls,